Today I am taking the wall out of this old barn and turning it into a dining room table for my in-laws. Hey everyone, how's it going? So a couple of years ago my in-laws renovated their kitchen and dining room and they asked me to build them a dining room table using some reclaimed barn wood. It made sense to me that I am most likely not the only one trying to make something out of reclaimed barn wood, so I decided to break down the process so that you can follow along. I have a fair bit of work in front of me, so... Let's get into it. Step number one, purchase or harvest the barn wood. I could have purchased some previously reclaimed barn wood from, for example, Backroads Reclamation, who you can check out in the description below, or I could go for a drive in the country and find a farm with an old barn where the farmer doesn't mind me taking a chunk of wall out of it. We went with option two since my father-in-law's family farm was relatively close to home and it already had a barn that was falling down that we could harvest. So my wife, her parents, and myself went for a day trip out to the farm to take a chunk of wall out of the 100-year-old barn. From what I can tell, this barn was constructed more like an old log cabin with dowels stabilizing the logs and sheeting on the outside. The sheeting was a little bit thin for my needs, so we ended up leaving that behind, but we did take a bunch of the logs back home with us. We ended up taking around 25 or so of these 6-foot logs, and now that I have them, I need to slice them into individual boards. Step two, slicing the barnwood. There is a few ways to do this. Method number one, just get someone else to do it. If you know someone with a big bandsaw or a bandsaw mill, you might be able to get them to slice the logs into lumber for you. This is what we did for a good portion of the logs since at the time I didn't have the equipment to do it myself. I contacted Pipestone Timber, who you can also check out in the description below. I ended up taking 14 or so of these logs over there and got them to use their bandsaw mill to slice the logs into roughly inch and a half thick boards. If you're going to go this route though, there is a couple things to keep in mind. One, make sure that you pull out whatever nails may be embedded as well as you can at least to avoid damage to other people's equipment. The bigger those bandsaw blades are, the more expensive they are to replace, so you don't want to be on the hook for that. Two. Factor in travel time to deliver and pick up your material. Pipestone is about an hour away from me, so it was about two hours of travel to drop off and pick up the logs, and there was about an hour of just chatting in there too, because, you know, it's always fun to talk shop once in a while. And three, your turnaround time. Whoever you take the material to might not be able to get to it right away. I lucked out, and Pipestone was able to get the boards back to me within about a week or so, so... Worked up. Method number two, buy the equipment and do it yourself. Not saying that you have to get yourself a full-on bandsaw mill, however, depending on the size of your material, you might be able to get away with a 14-inch floor standing bandsaw with a 3 quarter inch 3 TPI blade, teeth per inch. Personally, I upgraded my small benchtop bandsaw with about a 2 inch depth of cut to a freestanding 14 inch bandsaw with a 6 inch riser block, which gave me just over an 11 inch depth of cut. To give the logs a straight-ish first cut, I whipped up a quick jig out of some scrap sheet goods and cut a flat reference face on the table saw. Screw the log down into the jig fence and cut into your log. If you rotate it 90 degrees after your first cut, you'll still have a relatively flat reference surface to work from as you continue to slice the log. If you are going to go this route, one, again, check for nails. Two, equipment maintenance. You will want to make sure that your blade is sharp, tension properly, and the blade guides are set properly. Otherwise, this will be a bit of a miserable time. Don't ask me how I know. An alternative to the bandsaw is an Alaskan mill attachment for a chainsaw. I can't actually speak to this one despite owning one because my chainsaw is too small to work with the one that I have. Wish I had known that before I bought it, but I bought it three years ago and I hadn't gotten around to slicing the logs I already have in stock, which is another project video altogether. Which hasn't come out yet, even though it's been three years. Still working on it. Guess I'm going to have to buy a new chainsaw now. I'm not all that upset about that. Method number three, hand tools. Yeah, it's possible. Not something I want to do, so I'm not going to. Whichever method you choose, you should now have some rough cut lumber at whatever thickness you decided to cut the logs, and that should now be a lot more usable with whatever tools you might have in your arsenal, which helps for the next step. Step number three, squaring up your lumber. As in making it a square shape, it won't be perfectly square yet. Method number one, again, 
get someone else to do it. This one is a little bit more dependent on who you end up hiring to slice up your logs, but you might be able to get them to slice all of the live edges off at the same time and cut it into planks first. However, that might not be an option, and depending on the size of the material, it might be a lot less effective in terms of maintaining the amount of usable material. That would also depend on the equipment being used, so really, it's just a whole lot of dependencies, so your results may vary. Method number two, table saw sleds. This was my preferred method. Using the Live Edge Decimator, I built a few videos back, which you can check out up here. I ripped both long sides of the current batch of lumber straight with the second side just off the table saw fence to give me four rough cut, more or less straight edges. Worked out well. Method number three, circular saw. This one is similar to the table saw sled, however, it's a little less costly if you don't already own a table saw. Using a level or some other kind of straight edge, mark a line down the length of the board to indicate your cut location and send your circular saw down as straight as possible. Then measuring across the board to get a parallel measurement, repeat your steps to cut off the alternate side. Method number four, hand tools. Again, I'm good not using hand tools, but you could pretty much repeat method three and use a hand saw instead of a circular saw to do the same thing. For this next step, depending on the quality of your barn wood, you might be able to skip it. Mine definitely needed it though. You might have noticed so far that this lumber has a fair bit of cracking, checking, bug tracks, rot, etc. So, step number four, stabilizing your barn wood. So now that you know what it is, if you don't need to stabilize your lumber, you can skip to this timestamp, but we don't mind having you stick around for a while. Why not? Come on. Method number one, epoxy resin. Admittedly though, before I can start that step, I need some epoxy advice, and I hit up Scott over at the Crafty Wiener, who you can check out up here, and we figured out a plan to make this work. To keep the epoxy in the boards, especially since they are still at the rough stage, I completely enclosed five of the six sides of the board with some tuck tape. I'm using a couple different eco epoxy products here since they were what I found readily available to me. For the small cracks, I'm trying the UV epoxy line since it's more designed for coating slash low thickness applications with a 20 minute working time and a full cure time of 48 hours. For the bigger cracks, I'm using the Flowcast line since it's more designed for casting and higher thickness applications with an 8 hour working time and a full cure time of 72 hours. Now for the sake of the table build, my first thought was to use some black tinted epoxy to play off the century old weathering and aging. However, I wasn't sure how well that would play with the bug tracks running throughout the board. Luckily, the tint doesn't affect how you mix the epoxy either way, so mix up the epoxy as per the manufacturer's directions, and once the mixing time is up, you're good to slowly start pouring into, into the cracks, which took a few days over multiple pours. After the first couple boards were done, I decided not to go with the black tint and to use the flow cast for everything since it does have the longest cure time. That gave me a lot more infiltration into the board than the UV epoxy did. Yes, it works out to more pores since the wood drinks up more of the epoxy, but it I think it gives me a better product long term. Some things to keep in mind here. It will take a lot of time, like a lot. Each pour takes three days to cure. Luckily, the previous pour is solidified enough that you can do another pour after 48 hours or so. The first one will just be a little gummy, or like soft to the touch. Though, considering each board needs two to three pours, you could be looking at a week's worth of curing time per board. And it's gonna take up space. My workbench is only two by four feet in area, so I could only fit five to six boards on it at a time. So considering the time factor, if you had an unlimited amount of space, you could in theory have everything done in a week, week and a half. Since I needed 50 to 60 individual boards, it took me nearly six months to start and stop work on epoxy, finally getting everything filled for the amount that I needed. And it's not cheap. I think I'm at $1,500 Canadian in eco epoxy alone on this project. It's crazy. And of course, the health factor. Follow the instructions on the bottle, ventilated area, respirator, nitro gloves, etc. But what if you don't have a bunch of area to fill and the wood is just on the soft side as opposed to falling apart rotten? Well, that takes us to method number two, cyanoacrylate or, as is known more commonly, CA or super glue. Did you know that CA glue comes in different thicknesses? Let's take 2P10 for example. Thin, 
medium, thick, and gel. While you could use the latter two, thick and gel, for some minor gap filling, the thin and medium, more thin, can be used more as a penetrating hardener. Pour it on, let it soak in and dry, and you should be good to go. At least on the top half inch or so of the surface. If you wanted to get more deep into the material, you're going to have to get more into method three. So, method three. Vacuum or pressure chamber. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to use either of these two options, so take what I say here with a grain of salt. This will also depend on the size of material that you are working with and whether or not it will fit in whatever vacuum or pressure chamber that you have. For the sake of argument, let's say we are using the flow cast again and you already have it all mixed up in your container. You take whatever material you want stabilized and you submerge it into the epoxy and you put it into whatever chamber you have. If it's a vacuum chamber, it will pull all of the air inside of the chamber out which will include any air inside the wood, which will then be replaced by the flow cast. If it's a pressure chamber, you just pack that full of air, which compresses whatever air inside the wood to take up less space, which forces the flow cast to fill in the empty space. Like I said though, grain of salt. I know what these do in theory, but I can't actually speak for their effectiveness since, I, again, I've never done it. So now that your lumber is stabilized, or it was already stable and you've just rejoined us from step three, step number five actually squaring up your lumber. In step three, we took the rough lumber and brought it down to a square-ish shape, whereas now we are actually making all of the sides 90 degrees from each other. Method number one, like before, get someone else to do it. If you know a local woodworker, you might be able to bribe them with a nice bottle of whiskey to run the boards through their thickness planer or jointer. Never hurts to ask. In my script, this is supposed to be whiskey, but you know, it's 9.30 in the morning, so coffee instead. Method number two, again, buy the equipment and do it yourself. Like I mentioned in method one, the best method would be a thickness planer and a jointer. You can check out this video by James King over at King's Fied Woodworking to learn everything you need to know about thickness planers and jointers and how they work. I don't own a jointer, so I didn't end up using one. However, you can get by with a thickness planer and a table saw with a couple of jigs. It might be slightly slower, but from what I can tell, just as effective. To joint the wide faces, I just repeatedly ran the boards through the planer to take off 1 16th, 1 32nd of an inch each time, flipping the board each pass to slowly smooth out any differences over time. Then to joint the short sides, if the boards are less than three inches tall, you can take them to the table saw again with the live edge decimator. If they are more than three inches tall, you can build a jointing jig to run the boards through the planer to joint the short sides. You can check out the jointing jig I built for this project up here. Method number three, hand tools. I'm still good, yeah, it's fine. I'm okay spending the money and getting a little bit faster equipment, but with enough time and determination, it is completely possible to have a perfectly thickness and squared board with enough time and effort. If I only had one board to do, I could maybe be persuaded to go that way, but with the 50 to 60 that I needed, no, not happening. And with that, with those five steps, I have taken the rough barn wood to a perfectly squared piece of usable lumber. This is the nicer side. Now with all of that material ready to go, the next step is joinery. First, by finding center on the tops and bottoms of the two iframe legs and marking out around the entire board with a square and marking knife. Then breaking out the depth gauge and setting it to approximately one third of the four x four legs, I can mark out the two side offcuts of the tops and bottoms and centers of the uprights and getting them ready for removal. Making sure to color in the sections to be removed with a pencil so I don't screw up, which I didn't. To do that, I started off using a handsaw and chisels to take out the waste. However, that was taking way too long and wasn't nearly as accurate as I would like. So for the tops and bottoms outer waste removal, I break out the circular saw with the blade set to the same one third depth and a speed square to keep the saw straight on at least the first two outer cuts and then remove the bulk of the waste with a series of cuts where now I can just break out the remaining material and clean up with a chisel. For the uprights, I attempted the pull saw and chisels again, which worked a little bit better than before, but still ridiculously slow. So I broke out my oscillating saw and cleared out the majority of the waste with that instead. In the past, I've typically only used the oscillating saw when I'm cutting drywall or I'm trying to do more surgical demolition. This is the first time I've tried it for joinery, and I was actually pretty impressed with how well it worked out. 
Since the blade really only vibrates a quarter inch back and forth, it was still pretty easy to see where it was going to be cutting and adapt as required to keep it parallel with the marking line. I should try it with some dovetails at some point, just to see how it works out. With the bulk of the waste material now cleared out, I can work on the final fitment with the chisel and occasionally the random orbit sander to take off just a touch and slowly carve away at the joinery before the two pieces slip together and repeated that process another three times to finish off the main portion of the legs. With the two leg assemblies now completed, it's time to connect them. I'm going to go with two top stretchers and one lower center stretcher, starting with the center stretcher. The center stretcher is connected to the leg assemblies with a mortise and tenon joint, so I jump over to the bandsaw and start cutting the tenons. I set the fence at a half inch and a stop block four and a quarter inches back from the front of the blade to allow a little bit of extra length to be cut flush after the fact, off the tenon. After I cut the waist sides off of the tenon with the pole saw and a little bit of clean up in the corner with the chisel, I noticed that the tenon ended up a little bit more trapezoidal than square, which isn't all that useful for a mortise and tenon. I guess my bandsaw isn't quite as tuned up as it should be. To fix this, I would take it to my crosscut sled and clean up the tenon on the table saw, though unfortunately I still haven't built a new one from when I accidentally cut it in half. It's on the list of projects. I also don't really have the time to dedicate to building a new sled at the moment, so I ended up just buying a new miter gauge, since I didn't have one anyway. And it only took me an hour to do, as opposed to losing half a day to building a new sled. I figured it was a good investment, and I'm actually quite impressed with it. After the tenon was cleaned up, I figured I would set the center stretcher off to the side for now and turn my attention back to the leg assemblies. Since I still had the miter gauge set up, I chamfered the bottom corners of the two tops and knocked out the top corners to allow for the half lap that the top stretchers require, with a little bit more corner cleanup with the chisel. Now turning my attention over to the top stretchers, I chamfered the bottom outer corner along the entire length popped the miter gauge back onto the table saw and did one pass on the table saw to finalize the distance of the other half of the half lap. I would have taken out the corner in multiple passes like I did with the waist on the legs or the tenons. However, the stretchers were only riding on the mitered end and really weren't all that stable, so I took out the rest of the waist with the oscillating saw and just kept it as square as I could, coming back and cleaning up with a chisel at the end. At this point, I figured I did enough work. I earned myself a little bit of a sneak peek to the final product. Man, I'm happy. That looks good. I'm gonna have to shave the tops of the legs down an eighth of an inch. I'm very happy. This is fantastic. And now with all of the distractions out of the way, I could turn my attention back to the center stretcher, or at least the mortise portions of the center stretcher. After marking out the mortise location on the uprights of the leg assemblies, I threw an auger bit into my drill and began hogging out the majority of the waist. And again, tried to use the chisel to clear out the rest, but was still taking too long, so oscillating saw it is. Once the mortise was cleared out, I swapped over to a file for the finessing on both the mortise and the tenon. Oh. Let's just hit that with some CA glue and activator. Don't want that knot coming loose while I'm trying to fit these together. With enough back and forth, I was able to get the tenons in the mortises and everything together again for another test fit. I guess I'm pretty much on glue up. With all of the joinery now cut, it's time for the multi-stage glue up using some sacrificial pieces to make sure I'm not marring up the faces, and doing my best to make sure everything is square. The first step being attach the bottom of the legs to the uprights. Second step is top of the legs to the rest of the leg assembly. Each glue step had more or less 24 hours to dry. Not that it needed that long, it just worked out better for me timeline wise between sleeping and the day job and all that fun stuff. Next up is the center stretcher into the leg assemblies, but here I decided to go with wedged tenons. So I cut some kerfs into the tenon on the bandsaw as well as some wedges which I sanded to clean up. And then with some glue I can knock the leg assemblies and stretcher together 
and knock the wedges into the tenons. In hindsight, I should have gone with something a little bit harder than the barn wood scraps, maybe some maple or something, but I was more focused on keeping the lumber looking relatively consistent. One of the last glue up steps is the side stretchers, but they will require a little bit more work before I can glue them down. I moved the table base down onto the shop floor and made sure that the base was level to, in theory, make sure that there wasn't going to be a twist in the table. We'll see how successful I was later on. Moving back to the top stretchers. Unfortunately, my measurements of the half lap were a little bit screwy, so the top stretchers didn't line up with the tops of the base. Off camera, I whipped up a quick zero clearance insert for my table saw and rated my scrap bin for the original cutoff of the half lap since it was already the correct size I would need. Then I could rip off several shims just to bring the stretcher back up to the tops of the legs. Took a couple of tries to get the right thickness for the shims, but I got there eventually. The shims were glued and taped down, and the next day I glued down the stretchers, which was probably one of the more complex clamping processes of this whole project. Before I can call the base complete, I remember I need to add in some feet. I had this last full board since this one was too thin to be used in the tabletops. Over at the table saw, I cleaned up the two sides and cut it to the same width of the legs. Ripped the board down to just over 3 quarter inch thickness over at the bandsaw. Planed the rough sawn face smooth over at the thickness planer. Fill in the couple air bubbles with some CA glue and activator. Sand the glue smooth with the random orbit sander. Back over at the table saw, I break out the miter gauge, set the stop block to the same thickness as the legs, and cut off four segments. Now that I've made a couple coasters, I tossed the miter gauge and beveled the blade to 45 degrees and lopped all of the top corners of the four coasters. Now that the table coasters are done, I just need to glue them onto the table legs, using some painter's tape to hold them in place until I can get the clamps on until the glue dries. With the base built to this point, I decided to start on the multiple tabletops. So the first step for this portion is to figure out the layout of the panels. Since I already have my breadboard ends cut to length, I'm using these as my guides to figure out how many boards I need per top, since none of them are the same width, and lay out all of the boards across the breadboards. Once I have the number of boards figured out, I start flipping through and figuring out the best compromise between grain pattern, epoxy quantity, bug tracks, and general aesthetic. As much as I want the most interesting looking boards on the show side of the tabletops, that isn't necessarily the best for the stability of the tabletop in the long term. When building a panel like this, you want to make sure that you are alternating grain directions between boards. For the ease of explanation, we'll call it smiley and sad face alternating. Since all of this material, albeit being over a century old, was only milled recently, in theory, there is still some board tension that will be released over time. If your panel is straight smiley faces, the board can relax downward, causing a big hump in the middle of your panel, and the opposite can happen if it is straight sad face, where it'll just curve up. Either way, you'll be getting a Pringle out of it. Ideally, the end grain of your panel should look more like a bunch of mood swings. Happy sad, happy sad, happy sad, all the way through the panel. The boards will still slowly release tension, but the panel will remain relatively flat, with all of the boards cancelling the adjacent board's movement out. After numbering the boards to make sure I kept each panel in the right order and marking out the location for the alignment biscuits on the top, I repeated the process for the remaining two tabletops. With all of the boards for the tabletops marked out, I set up the fence on my router table since it was the first thing I thought of that wasn't on my workbench that I could use to push against and began cutting out all of the slots for the biscuits, making sure to keep all of the boards oriented the same way so that if the biscuit slots were off center, the boards themselves would still be aligned. Now that all of the biscuit slots are cut, I can start the glue up process. I made sure to set up some taped up 2x4s first, the tape to keep the tabletop from gluing itself to the 2x4s and the 2x4s to keep the panel flat during the glue up. Filling the slots with biscuits and gluing the seams, I knocked each board together until all of the boards were at least touching. Then I can throw on the 48 inch clamps and start cinching down the panel, though you'll notice that it starts to bow up in the middle the more I tighten down the clamps, which means it's time for the calls. Reset those, clamp them down, retighten the main clamps, and set the top off to the side and repeat that process for the next two tabletops. The next day I came back and started to unclamp the tops, 
And when you're unclamping the calls, you want to make sure that you unclamp it from one end down to the other and make sure that your head is right next to the loose end. Oh. Ow. <laughs> Idiot. I guess while you're unclamping it, it makes sense to also scrape off any of the glue drips at that point. Why not? The last thing I need to do on the tops is cut a straight edge for the breadboard ends to attach to, which I did with a couple squares, circular saw, and table saw. Now that I have a flat reference face, I can start on the floating tenons for the breadboards. I decided to use some leftover pallet slats from my patio furniture build since they were already the correct width required. Heading over to the thickness planer, I ran the pallet scraps through down to a half inch thickness. With that completed, I pulled the router back out with the tenon jig I built off camera and measured the remaining length of the four inch long, half inch upcut spiral bit. Okay, so it's one and seven eighths, so that's three and three quarter. Yeah, three and three quarter, and that'll give me a little bit of wiggle room. Setting said measurement on the miter gauge for the table saw, I cut many tenons. Though I didn't realize it wasn't enough at the time, so I'll need to do everything over again for a few more. But for the sake of the video, it was done perfectly and with the required total the first time around. Using the completed table base as a workbench holding the tabletops, I mark out the tenon locations on both of the breadboard and tabletops simultaneously with the tenon jig. Now when I go to route out the mortises for the tenons, I just need to line the tenon jig up with the same marks and I'll be good to go. With the router prepped with the four inch long, half inch upcut spiral bit, half inch bushing, tenon jig, and clamps to hold the tenon jig in place, I can start routing out all of the mortises, starting in the breadboards. I'd gone with the upcut bit because they are designed to pull the wood debris up and out of the cut. However, combined with the tenon jig and bushing on the router closing in the top of the mortise, it basically just jammed them all with the chips inside the cut, which required me to stop the cut every few seconds and manually pull all of the chips out with the help of the dust collector and a dental pick. Unfortunately, this did burn me a couple times. Well, not burn me, uh, per se, but a couple of the times the shavings did pack up and heat up to the point of starting embers, which luckily I caught before they were pulled into the dust collector. That could have been bad. With the tabletops and breadboards all mortised out, I turned my attention back to the tenons. Putting the router back into the router table with a roundover bit, I rounded over the four side corners of the tenons so that they would more easily fit into the mortises. Speaking of the mortises, let's start gluing tenons in them. I throw one of my magnetic parts trays in a sanders bag since it was the closest bowl thing I could think of in the shop and filled it full of wood glue. Then I can smear some glue in the middle of the top and bottom of the tenon and some CA glue on the sides for the immediate hold. Blast some activator into the mortise, insert the tenon, and hold it in place for a couple seconds. The wood glue will provide the long term hold while the CA glue will provide the clamping force. Since the tenons were slightly thinner than the mortises, I wanted to make sure that all of the tenons were consistent in height, depth, angleage, etc. However, I didn't want to clamp them in place since all of the wood is softwood and I was concerned that the clamps would end up marring the surface of the table too much. The next day I could come back and clean up some of the glue squeeze out so that the breadboards could actually sit all of the way... Oh. Oh man! Yeah, still, still bottoms out an eighth of an inch away. So, that means I have to go through and cut every tenon a quarter of an inch shorter. That's 26 glued in tenons. That's annoying. I ended up grabbing a scrap to use as a cutting guide and cut 3 sixteenths of an inch off of each of the 26 tenons. That was a nice waste of time. Now that the breadboard is actually seating properly, I can start locking them in. My first attempt didn't go all that well, for three reasons. A. Working on the tenons first, because you know, the best spot to do all of your detailed marking and measurements is somewhere you're immediately going to cover up and not being able to see. Two, working on the tenons first, again, because it makes sense to do all of your drilling with the final size bit and not expecting it to drift at all. And D, 
knocking in the dowels without thinning the entering end enough, causing a bit of damage on the way out, which was relatively easy to fix by forcing the splinter back in place and CA gluing it back down. My second through sixth attempts went much better. I marked out the drill locations on the breadboard itself and drilled through the breadboard and tenons all at once with a 1 16th inch bit. Now I can pull the breadboard back off and I know exactly where everything lines up on the tenon so I can proceed to drill out my 3 8 inch hole immediately north of the original pin hole by an eighth of an inch to offset the dowel. Making sure to elongate the outer holes to allow the panel to move back and forth with seasonal movement. With the tenons drilled out I can move back onto the breadboard and drill out the original holes on the original pin holes, but not elongating any of the holes in there. Last step before locking the breadboard down to the tabletop is to slather a bunch of wood glue onto the center tenon only to split the difference of expansion and contraction between the two halves of table. Then I can seat the breadboard into place and begin knocking the dowels into the table. After knocking off one end with the pencil sharpener just to avoid the blowout I had in the first attempt. Then on the last quarter inch or so of the dowel I throw on a little bit of wood glue and tap it in just to lock the dowel into the top of the breadboard but not the tenon. The next day once everything was dried out I can cut the dowels flush and cut the tabletop and breadboard flush with the circular saw since it is a little bit too big for the table saw. And with that the breadboards are done. It might have been a little bit easier if the material I was working with wasn't riddled with rot and bug tracks, but it is what it is. It might have also been easier if I was able to do integral tenons as opposed to floating tenons. It might have saved on router time, but I'm not actually sure. If you don't know what I mean or if I'm using the wrong terminology, what I did here was floating tenons, where the connecting material between the panel and the breadboard is not part of either piece. The integral tenon would be if I cut or routed off one third of the top and bottom of the panel and fit it inside of the breadboard. I would have liked to have done that instead, however I didn't have enough material prepared. As is, I used pretty much every board I had, and if I had cut the extra four inches I would have needed for integral tenons on both sides, the rough boards I was able to get two out of, I would have only been able to get one board out of, and I would have been about six boards short for the whole project which would have added another two to three weeks of epoxy and milling time to this project, which I didn't have. Next up is sanding, starting with 60 grit and finished with 80 grit for now. Since these tabletops are still kind of rough in terms of bug tracks, I figured there wasn't much point in moving past 80 grit at this point. This round of sanding is just to level out the seams to make the next step easier. Once the first round of sanding is done, I move the tabletops into my basement finishing room where I break out the epoxy again and just did a couple coats of the Ecopoxy UV Poxy which is more designed for thin applications and just scraped a small amount over the top side of the tabletops to fill in any holes that weren't already filled. I only did this on the top side of the table since that's the surface that's going to see the most contact and this way it avoids getting any food or crumbs inside of the tabletops. While the tabletops were doing their epoxy thing again, I jumped back onto the table base and figured out the interior structure for the leaf extension hardware. I ended up going with a couple 2x4s cut to fit just inside the legs and stretchers. Conveniently enough, they were already the perfect thickness without having to send them through the thickness planer to allow the table extensions I picked up to be just level with the top of the table base. After I cut the boards to length and using the offcut scrap from the table coasters, I mathed out the location of the half laps needed between the three boards. Over at the table saw, I broke out the miter gauge and hogged out the half laps. I didn't realize this until the edit. It looks like this board was a little bit bowed and wasn't all the way down onto the table. Makes sense why one of the half laps didn't quite work out. Spoiler alert. To secure the interior frame onto the table base, I went with the only few screws in this whole project and went with pocket holes. The long pieces held themselves into the table pretty easily with tension, however the short piece really didn't want to, so I used some squeeze clamps to hold that in. And with the help of the automotive creeper I've had bolted to the garage ceiling for the last several years, it was quite easy to get in and out from underneath the table to get the interior frame screwed in. With the framing complete, I can get the tabletop extensions installed, center an extension on each long 2x4, clamp it down, pre-drill, and screw it down.
And finally, to allow the bolts to screw down the tabletop onto the extensions, I drilled out a few access holes in the extended portion of the extensions. Moving back over to sanding, I started with the base since it was already in the shop, and at this point in time, the tabletops were still doing their second round of epoxy treatment. I worked my way up the grits up to 220, which was a lot of faces to remember to hit between the 60, 80, 120, and 220 grit rounds. But I think I got them all. With the table base sanded and the tops finished epoxy again, I bring them back in the shop and attack them with 60 grit once again to clear off the inconsistent epoxy pour, which actually took a lot longer than I was expecting. The sanding inevitably opened up some of the bug tracks, so instead of epoxying them again, I just filled the pinholes with some CA glue, hitting a large chunk with some activator toward the end just to avoid sticking my elbows into it while trying to reach the middle of the tops. Once the CA glue was dry, you guessed it, more sanding. So much sanding, in fact, I think it warrants borrowing David Picciuto's joke. Sand in the place where you live. Check out the Make Something YouTube channel if you haven't yet. I'll put a link up here if you're interested. Sometime between starting and finishing the 220 grit pass, I decided I didn't really care for the sharp edge of the tabletops, and after finishing the sanding, I broke out the router with a chamfer bit, and chamfered all of the edges on the three tabletops, followed by yet more sanding. I also hit all of the outer edges of the table base with the router as well, except it doesn't seem like I filmed that. At this point, the sanding is mostly done, and I can move on now to finishing. Down in my basement finishing room, I hit the tabletops with four coats, and the table base with three coats of clear satin polycrylic. I went with polycrylic because it dries fast, and it didn't yellow the wood. Between coats, I hit everything with 320 grit and a tack cloth. And then to finish off at the end, I hit everything with a 3000 grit sanding pad. While I was sanding, I noticed that the table base was rocking back and forth a fair bit. Now, I know my table saw and workbench might not be completely level, but yeah, not quite what I wanted. Just to be sure, I figured I would throw some adjustable feet in the table. Between a couple Forstner bits in the center of the table coasters, a threaded insert, a screw-in foot, gives me a little insurance to make sure that the table I'm building is not a rocking table. Rocking chair might be on the list eventually, but not today. Once I had the table base flat on the ground again, I can start figuring out actually attaching the tops to it. My first thought was to center and clamp the tabletop into place, drill into the tabletop from underneath, pull the tabletop back off, and then install the threaded inserts. However, that didn't work for multiple reasons. The drill bit I used was bent and I didn't have it lined up correctly, which made a couple of the threaded inserts not line up. And then holding the tabletop while also trying to screw it into the extended extensions with the misaligned holes just didn't work out. It was kind of a disaster all around. After thinking about securing the tops for a while, I decided that the best course of action was to lay them on top of the workbench, pull the extensions back off the base, and lay them on top of the underside of the tops, and go from there. And here's where I was able to confirm that the threaded inserts were misaligned, because I couldn't get them screwed in. So, out comes the threaded inserts, both extensions swap sides, and new holes are drilled in for each threaded insert which are reinstalled with a little bit of CA glue to lock them in. I guess lock them in a little bit better than nothing. You just watched me pull them all back out after installing them with CA glue, so a little bit better. With the threaded inserts installed, I can get the extensions bolted back down. I got tired of fighting with these stupid little Allen keys to get these screwed in, so I sacrificed one of my less used spark plug sockets and cut a slot in the side of it to fit the Allen key, which gave me a lot more leverage with the ratchet to get these bolts cinched down. Once we had everything over at the in-laws, I reconnected the tabletops, brought the table base in, adjusted the feet, first try I might add, set the tops into place, recentered everything, screwed the extensions back down to the base, and tighten down the bolts onto the threaded inserts again. And with that, other than a couple of the leveling brackets for the two halves of top that were stuck in shipping, I installed them a few weeks later, this project is finally done. I think I am safe to say that this is my largest, most complicated woodworking project to date, and it is definitely my longest running project. This took a long time to get finished. There was a lot of firsts, for sure. First time working with resin, mortise and tenons, breadboards, hell, even just using the bandsaw on anything more than two inches thick. 
I am more than happy with how this project turned out, and I know that my in-laws are happy with it as well, even though it took me more than two years to get it finished. From a falling down barn built over 100 years ago on the family farm to a dining room table that will hopefully have another 100 years of use. Like I said, I am very happy with it. And with that, thank you all for watching, and if you like what I'm doing here, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. If you have any questions or comments, I look forward to reading them in the comment section below. And if you want to see more up-to-date projects, you can always follow me on Instagram at John the Shriner. Otherwise, I will see you here in the next video, and have a good one.